in Philippians chapter 2, a backstory. <laughs> Paul has been imprisoned and released, and imprisoned and released. And in between, he's been beaten and flogged and tricked and lied to and tortured and starved. Prison's probably a break from all that. And he's writing the Philippians, the church in Philippi, and he's saying, I'd really like to have some good news about you guys. <clears throat> End of backstory. Philippians chapter 2 begins with, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. <clears throat> if you don't win the goldfish, you get the consolation prize. The consolation prize is supposed to keep little Johnny or, or Jane from crying hysterically because he or she did not get the goldfish. It's to console them. Why they give them a, a weird little plastic fish instead of a quarter or candy or crack cocaine is beyond me. Because when did a little plastic figure make up for not winning a goldfish? When you try to flick dimes into the goldfish bowls when it's impossible to do it. Or ping pong balls. Ping pong, I love that. I always made my dad really mad because I always won. I always came home with the goldfish. But the best part is I made sure we went to that booth right when we got to the carnival. That was a long day of carrying the goldfish for dad. <laughs> I didn't want the goldfish, give it to the cat, who cares? I just wanted to see that look on my dad's face all day when he futzed with the goldfish. Because why he couldn't just walk to the car or give someone five bucks to keep it so we could pick it up on the way out or put his foot down and not allow me to win it in the beginning of the trip was beyond me, but the fact was, was I knew I could win a goldfish and he'd have to carry it for the entire day. I love that. I love that. Is my goldfish okay? Is my goldfish okay? Millions of times, I was just a blast. I loved going out with dad to the fair. So, <laughs> Paul's saying, I don't have the freedoms that you people have. I don't have the lifestyle that you people have. I'm not getting married and divorced and having kids and having them grow up and hate me. And, and I'm not starting businesses and I'm not buying stuff and, and, and I don't have Netflix streaming, which by the way, I'm really enjoying. Thank you very much. And uh, you, know, I, you know what I'm saying? I, I don't have all this stuff, but you know it would be a nice consolation to me to know that you guys are actually acting like Christians. That would be really neat. You know, how about, how about that there's comfort of love? How about if there is fellowship of the Spirit? How about if there's affection and mercy? How about if you guys are like-minded and of one accord, having the same love and one mind, and, let, and that you don't do anything out of selfish ambition, you don't do anything out of conceit, but you all function in lowliness of mind and you esteem others better than yourself. And you don't just look out for your own interests, but you look out for the interests of, my gosh, if only I had thought of this, I would say this is what 
we should invent in America. Because, oh yeah, we did. It was called church. That's what it was. This was the foundation for fellowship. These people weren't all blood. They probably weren't even all friends. But he is addressing a church. A church where he is saying, for all I've done for you, the only thing I ask as a consolation, my little plastic fish, is that your behavior will reflect that of a church that Jesus has visited and chosen to stay at through his spirit. That I will see people who love people. I will see people who take care of people. I will see people that agree can I just do it? That's a three, damn it. Gosh. You know, people come into church environments all the time and then they bring their own weird doctrine. And they say, how about here? Let's discuss this. That's not like-minded. How hard is this for people to get? If I go to your house, I eat what's served. That's just it. That's in the Bible. Not the way it says in the Bible. But that's how I would have written it. But this is so frustrating. This is so frustrating because Paul is saying this is what would reflect union and unity with the Holy Spirit is that you would be like-minded. Now, how can you be like-minded if you're individuals? It sounds more like a choice that when we gather and when we gather in Jesus' name, there are things that matter and there are things that don't. And the things that matter, we are all in one accord with, and we will bond to, as a group in unity, in one accord with one thing, and that would be to be expressions of Christ's love on planet Earth in a fashion that works respectfully and selflessly with your brothers and sisters on both sides of you. It sounds a lot like, can you just behave for an hour and a half? That's just me. It sounds an awful lot like, can you behave for an hour and a half? And can you not, like, grab people in the parking lot and go, I totally didn't agree with that, and I didn't agree with the pastor, and I definitely, you know, can you, can, you, can you get there and get home without backbiting? Can you get there and get home without murmuring? Can you get there and get home without your big fat ego taking over the conversation and you preaching your, your own gospel? Can you do it? Can you do it? I mean, really. What's so interesting is that the church in Philippi, they were probably together all the time. Or the majority of the time. Whereas church in America in 2000 and, and what years is um, that it's really, God, you only have to be good for an hour now. You only have to be good for an hour. And you got to get through those busy parking lots, though. That's why they have cops. <laughs> I love going to church where they have cops directing traffic in the parking lot because we'll kill each other in the parking lot. I love that. I love that. That gives me hope. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen that before. When I went to a church, I go, why are the cops here? And the people I was with said, oh, they're here every week. And I go, what do you mean they're here every week? Well, they maintain order in the parking lot. I go, because those pesky Christians. <laughs> Gosh, did someone say there's a, 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 a bingo game and only five minutes to get to it? Gosh, guys. <clears throat> Paul is addressing one of my least favorite subjects, humility. <laughs> He's addressing humility. That humility is, in this instance, esteeming others better than yourself. So saying, what this person needs right now is more important than what I need right now. What this person needs prayer for right now is more important than me getting all the attention. It's, it's more important that people who are visiting feel comfortable than I get my way. I, I know a really hard one for me, and notice I'm the one standing. Um, 
You can take an end seat when there are seats available in the middle of the row and an usher comes and tells you to move down. That'll ruin my hour at church. Gosh, I'll panic. Oh my gosh, a whole hour of sitting here and I can't escape. <laughs> I can't escape. But really, we are a people that needs an usher to tell us that we need to move into the row. Um, and they say, and I love this, they'll say it's because we want to make sure every seat gets filled and people have a place to sit. What they're really saying is we don't want you to make 30 people crawl over you to get to their seats. And you're so rude you couldn't figure that out for yourself. You got your seat. I got my seat. And I'm saying, and I'm an end seat guy. By the way, it's totally okay to do this at movie theaters. First come, first heard of the movies, but not at church. I don't know why that is. I think I think I think we should split the difference and do it do what the Jews do. <clears throat> Pay for your seats in advance. And the end seats are more expensive. I think that's fair. I'm happy to pay for for end seat. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm happy to pay for the seats I want. Like-minded in one accord, in unity with the Spirit, esteeming others more than ourselves, putting others' interests before our own. Oh, I don't understand. What does it even mean? What would that really look like? Like, um, <clears throat> I have this memory of going to a large church where they had um, prayer circles. You know, in other words, <laughs> you're, you're in your seat, the pastor says, okay, we're going to break up into prayer circles now. And you're going to join hands with a person next to you, maybe another person next to you, and two or three of the people in the row in front or back of you. And I remember if you went on Wednesday night instead of Sunday morning, you saw an entire room full of people go like this. Prayer circles stand up and go like this. They're already like in the position to grab hands. And it was one of the weirdest things in the world. It was like, okay, 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 which, whose hand am I going to grab? And you could see like a sea of people doing this because they were so well trained. And you get into prayer circles and they were a little like, um, <clears throat> what's that called? Uh, prototype of what the big church at large in the world is like. You had, you're, you're with four or five people, you know, most of whom you probably don't know, <clears throat> unless you sat with your friends, but you're, you definitely have one or two people you don't know for sure. And then you have probably five minutes for five people to get prayer. Okay, so you have, <laughs> I, I'm laughing because I have so many funny memories of how this went down, not because it was bad, it was wonderful. It was wonderful, and I'm, I'm leading up to, to, the, to the wonderfulness, but you have one person who doesn't know how to say her prayer request in a sentence. So... Five minutes have gone by, nobody's gotten any prayer, and they're telling you to go back to your seats. Because, you know, one person's still telling you their story. Another person, or another person you get is someone who leads. Never like leaders. The leader is the person who goes, okay, you pray with you, you pray with you, you pray with you. Okay, people on this side say your prayer request to that person. Okay, people on that side say your prayer request to this person. Okay, let's pray. Got one of those. But every once in a while, you get two of my favorite people that go to church. The person genuinely in need. The person who, when they turn to you like a puppy dog, start crying. They just already just fall apart. Because they, it took all they could do to get to church. And hopefully, they land in the grasp of the other person that I like the most. The true, sincere Christian who's really walking by the Spirit, who has no thought 
for themselves when they walk into church, but only thoughts for others. And that person doesn't wait for a story. That person doesn't wait for the leader. That person moves in the spirit and does what the spirit needs done for this poor person who's falling apart. And it's irrelevant if we ever know what her problem was. The solution to her problem isn't my understanding of it. The solution to her problem is the consolation prize. The, the experience of the Holy Spirit, the exchange between her and God through the Holy Spirit, through a person, makes her trip to church fabulous. Because if she thought she could get it on her own, she was too weak and frail and upset and broken to drive. So she would have just said, you know, I, I'm just going to get before the Lord. But the person I'm imagining has been praying a long time and not getting anywhere. So she picks herself up and she goes to church because she knows that someone there will pray for her. And she, she's praying, whether she knows it or not, that she finds the Consolation Prize Christian that will care more about her than looking good in the prayer circle. If she's really fortunate, she will land on a Holy Spirit-filled prophet who hears the voice of God that right then and there tell her the very words she needs to hear. And best of all, with as little information as possible, I've seen amazing things happen in prayer circles in five minutes. And I've seen people come to the decision to never go to church again in those same five minutes. Sometimes in the same circle. <clears throat> I have had people walk up to me days later, weeks later, years later, lifetimes later and ask me how I was doing for the thing they prayed for. Isn't that wonderful? You all thought I was going to say, you prayed for me, Paisley, in this happened. You thought I was going to give some braggy praise report. The, I had the opposite happen. I've had people that I totally forgot come up to me and say, I prayed for you in a prayer circle once, and this is what was going on, and I always wondered how that ended. And I say, you're that person, aren't you? You're that person. What, what person is that? You're the person that goes to church with an attitude of, how can I serve? How can I help? God, where do you want me to sit where I'll be sitting next to someone that I can minister to? <clears throat> I've seen people walk into church and pray before they sit down. Usher say, come here, let, I'll put you over here. You know, and they'll say, no, I'm going to wait. I'll wait and back until God tells me where, where I need to be. Of course, if everybody did that, we'd have total chaos. <laughs> but it's a nice thought. <clears throat> I used to see church as the place where people got their training for the trenches. So church was like some really crazy, loud, and for the most part, pretty fun boot camp with simulated situations that you'll see in the world where you won't have the support and protection of a lot of strong believers around you. I used to see that. And then one day I realized that I started to see church as just an obligation and a chore. And now, you know, obviously in, in this decade, church is a, a force to reckon with. Church is a thing. Church is just like the world sees church. It's a thing. It's, a, it's an entity with an agenda. And I want, to, I want to believe that other people are reading the book of Philippians and reading that going, I'm not in one accord. Well, the problem is maybe you are. Maybe you go to a church where all of you are Nazis. 
But the problem is, the problem is, is he's talking about love and spirit. He's not saying you agree. You know, you know what I'm saying? I don't, I, gosh, I'm not in one accord with anything. I, I, don't, I don't know how that would be possible. You know, it's sort of like, what does one accord mean? You know, I was thinking about it. I was making a joke. We're not Christians. We're one accordions. You know, <laughs> and, and I was thinking that that was funny. And I was like, but what would we be one accordion to? Like, um, you know, we all insist on worshiping on Saturday. You know, I, I, I was talking about the Seventh Day Adventist the other day, and I love the Seventh Day Adventist, by the way. And um, they would give me Sunday off. Um, I like that, I'm, and they're predominantly a vegetarian, I like that. They have great, great potlucks. Um, and they always have uh, cooking classes. All the churches have cooking classes, like the one that, the one uh, nearby, they have a raw food cooking class, you know, for free. Just doesn't work out in my schedule. But anyways, you know, so we're all in one accord that we worship the same day, but we're not in one accord with the Baptist next door who disagree. So what are we in one accord with? What what can we be in one accord with it? There's only one thing. It has to be it has to be God, Jesus and the Holy Spirit in a I hate to say it, generic sort of way that encompasses a lot of of space for diversity. <laughs> diversity in Christianity, oil and water. We we are cool with diversity as long as it's over there. As long as it's over there. But in our group, we all have to be alike. This, this is what we believe. This is what we believe. This is what we believe. This is who we are. This is our creed. This is our mission statement. Our statement of faith. One accord, one mind, has to do with love, has to do with the recognition of the presence of the Spirit that teaches us love and allowing that Spirit to work in us and through us to others to be loving. Nice and friendly should be evident in that, but it goes deeper than nice and friendly. But nice and friendly is important in church. Nice and friendly is, uh, well, it's the deal breaker if you're not. That's a fact. The minute someone thinks you're not nice or friendly at church, there's a problem. But it has to go deeper than that. It has to go with a heart that is set on good works. A heart that is set on serving others. A heart that is in uh, one accord with Christ, that is like-minded with Christ, that esteems Christ higher than themselves, and recognizes that I am the star of my own life so that when I go to church, I can be humble, I can minister to others, I can love others, I can be there for others, because I have 20, no, 23 other hours on a Sunday to be the star of my own life. I really don't have to be the center. That's coming from me and I am the center as I speak and I'm listening to me going, I wonder if I'm, I'm a bad example. I mean, it's bad for me to preach this, but the problem is it's still the truth. And what I find is I am the center at church because that's what it's set up like. But the rest of my life when I go out in life I do not need to be the center. You know, like, when people find out you're a singer, the first thing out of their mouth is, oh, sing me a song. I love saying when I find out someone's a dentist, I go, hey, I got this pain right here, you know? You know, it's like, and they, the dentist always gets it. The dentist always gets that joke because, next, I, I don't know who gets it more, singers or dentists, but I think we're really high on the list of people who, the minute they find out what you do, the, the knee-jerk reaction is, oh, do it for me, right now. I'm like, no, I, I don't want to do that, and I don't want to go to an environment where I'm not performing and get asked to perform, and 
take over the room. I, I, I have my little platform and I'm happy. You know, there has to be a time in my life where I esteem others higher than myself, that I'm not the most important storyteller in the room and I, I'm not the center of the universe. And, and we all need to do that. My gosh, you know, I have kids, you need to teach your kids that. That they are the star of their own life and that's important, especially when they're kids. But there comes a time where they have to be so secure in their importance that they back off a little and allow other children to shine. And I think it's the same thing in church that um, you have a lot of people that have never been obedient and never finished Bible college or seminary or never pursued whatever ministry God would have had for them. So you have a lot of frustrated pastors. We call those Bible studies and you get, you get one of those guys in a Bible study and it's not a Bible study anymore, it's his church. I hate those guys because they, they my gosh, first they, I, I, and I mean this, I mean this, like aside from the fact that they derail a sit around a circle and talk about the Bible thing, because they really start telling you, well, I was studying this, and I saw this, and then I found this, and then I found this. I hate them because they're usually really good. And I'm thinking of someone in particular, and I was at a Bible study in, um, a couple times, and I was asked to come sing at a Bible study a couple times, and a couple times he talked so much there wasn't time for me to sing. And, you know, he came up to me after, I said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Paisley, you know, I'm you know, the Holy Spirit took over and I said, honey, that wasn't the Holy Spirit. You were out of control. You were out of control. See, the Holy Spirit took over me and I sat quietly. And anyone who knows me knows that's what it would take. The only thing that could get me to sit still for what I just endured in that room would be the Holy Spirit. Satan's not strong enough to pin me down. I said, but you, sir, are out of control. And the reason you're out of control is because you should be a pastor. You should be a preacher. You should be an evangelist. You have a real gift. No, 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 I don't. I just, I'm just, I'm just, a, I'm just a student. No, students shut up and learn. You are a teacher. You're just not invited to be a teacher here and you're driving everybody crazy and no one has the guts to tell you that you're ruining this. And if you don't stop, Within six months, there won't even be a Bible study of this church anymore. But you should be standing on the street corner doing that. You should be finding where God wants you to do that. And I see that a lot in all, a lot of churches, that you have really frustrated people. That's why they're excruciating. We have a few of those here. We still do. And the thing I see over and over again is people are unbearable, unbearable. And I have taken people aside who are unbearable and said, I hope you don't mind me telling you this, but you're unbearable. You're unbearable. I mean, you're excruciating. And anyone who knows me knows I'm not kidding. That that's exactly how I would address it. What else are you going to say? I think you might want to consider limiting how much you talk. No, I need you to shut up. That's the only thing that works. I need you to shut up because you're going to turn people off and God wants to raise you up a great leader. You're just using the wrong place to do it because you're frustrated. You're frustrated. And I think that's 99% of the time why people are unbearable to be around in church environments because they're frustrated. And if they were like-minded with the Holy Spirit of what's supposed to be happening in that environment, they would know this isn't about me right now. This isn't about me. This is about everyone else but me. If God wants you to preach, trust me, he'll give you a place to do it. I think a lot of people feel lost 